When you think about Chicago, what comes to mind? The Magnificent Mile, Deep Dish Pizza, Lake Michigan, Chicago style hot dogs, and then some other things like Al Capone. But as a real Chicagoan, I know that our city has so much more to offer. I'm Rob Foytick and I lead neighborhood tourism at Choose Chicago, the city's official tourism bureau and destination marketing organization, which basically means I get to work with residents all over the city to promote the best parts of where they live. I've eaten deep dish downtown, had a cocktail in the sky, and enjoyed a hot dog, no ketchup, in the friendly confines. But past the well-trodden downtown areas, I've found some of the real places driving our culinary narrative. From the Puerto Rican family making burritos to the neighborhood legend who's been making donuts by hand for the last 50 years, these are the places that have actually enabled us to become the culinary capital of the country. Since food is such a natural entry point into culture, we'll use these delicious bites holes in the wall, and hidden gems to learn the complicated history of some of our city's 77 neighborhoods. And meet the people who make these areas beyond downtown must visit cultural destinations. Let me take you on a journey to the 77. Uptown has always been a fascinating neighborhood full of contradictions. Historically, it was known as an entertainment district, housing venues like the Green Mill, the Riviera, and the Uptown Theater. Yet, in the shadow of these grand buildings, Uptown has also been an affordable refuge for outsiders and newcomers. Today, it's one of our most diverse communities with at least 67 languages spoken. Throughout the decades, Uptown has been a welcoming home to Asian, African, queer, and Appalachian communities. But in turn, that cultural richness is contributing to a growing demand for housing and business development, which has led to higher rents and a community in transition. So how does a neighborhood like Uptown preserve its cultural identity in the face of constant urban change and gentrification? One of the most prominent immigrant communities in Uptown are the Vietnamese who arrived in the 1970s and helped create what is now Asia on Argyle, a neighborhood strip in Uptown known for its diversity of Southeast Asian businesses. Naturally, this makes Uptown one of the best places to get authentic Vietnamese food in Chicago. One of the most beloved and delicious restaurants is Na Hong, which literally means Vietnamese restaurant. Here they're serving up cuisine from the Northern, Central, and Southern regions, so you're gonna wanna try a little bit of everything. Come on, let's get some pho. Nha Hong is the number one Vietnamese spot in the city of Chicago. His soups are literally a hug in a bowl. <laughs> this place does it right. There's so many different flavors. There's a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of spiciness, a little saltiness. It just takes you onto like a whole journey when you're eating the food. His pho is amazing. His spring rolls are to die for. This place feels like home. It almost feels like going to your uncle's house and he's cooking for you and he asks you if you're hungry. It's just the, the feeling of warmth here that I really love. Oftentimes, you know, instead of saying I love you in Vietnamese, the word is have you eaten? Bởi vì cái đồ ẩm thực của Việt Nam mình á, nó gồm có ba miền. Trung Nam, Bắc Mình phải nấu làm sao Để trong miền nào đi đến nhà hàng mình Ăn được, đều được hết Đều khen miếng ăn mình Là để trung hòa Mỗi món của tôi á Khi mà tiệm tôi làm ra Bộ cái thét Đều khác nhau Và nhà hàng của tôi Về cái khách hàng người đi đến đây á để ăn trong đó miếng ăn của tôi là được 247 món. A lot of these dishes are like dishes you would see all throughout Vietnam in all three regions. So it's the diversity of flavors and history and just different regional cuisine is really representative here. So I'm bang me. Those dishes in itself are really great. That's why they're known. Those are words in the American dictionary now. Actually, pho is pronounced Pho, like a question. Pho? Pho? Pho is normally eaten in the morning as breakfast and sandwiches really any time of the day. But if you want to kind of explore beyond 
those two staple items that Vietnamese cuisine is known for in the U.S. Restaurants like Nha Hang Vietnam here have pretty extensive menus, so I would just urge them and push them to, you know, try something new. I asked the owner, I said, what do you recommend? He's like, oh, the Boon Chaka. And he said it with such conviction, I was like, I need to try that. I have never loved a soup so much in my life. It is a fried fish cake soup with pineapple and tomato. And when you taste it, you can't live without it. Rồi sau đó đi đến đây, rồi ăn những cái món ăn nào. Tôi là cái người trực tiếp để ra giải trình với khách. Ờ, món này mình phải ăn như thế này, món này mình phải ăn như thế kia, món này thêm cái gì, món này thêm cái kia. Yeah, this is like a really quintessential Vietnamese style family meal. We have the rong muong, which is the water spinach with garlic, and it's sautéed, very delicious, has a little bit of a bitter flavor. And then we have the catfish in clay pot, and that's caramelized and it's braised. It has a little bit of sweetness, saltiness, and a little spiciness as well. And then we have the spicy fish soup here, the can chua ca, and that has so many different flavors and so many different textures. And together, these three different dishes combined are just full of flavor. For example, if you just eat the fish and clay pot, it is on the saltier side, so you do want to eat it with the rice and a little bit of the water spinach together. So it's really all about putting together the different yes, dishes. Yes, definitely. Đối với cộng đồng Ác, đối với cộng đồng Ác gai đó rất là quan trọng bởi vì trước năm 1975 đó khi mà 80 đó thì cái khu này nó coi như đai, nó chết rồi. Từ ngày mà có người trị nạn qua đó, họ cố gắng build lên Ác gai đó để thành một cái nó đại khái có thể so sánh như là Little Sài Gòn bên California đại khái và từ đó đó Cái con nửa gai đó mặc dù bắt thành ra từ chỗ đó nó rất là quan trọng đối với cộng đồng người Việt tại Chicago. Thành ra bác đấy đó là một cái sự sung sướng của bác và cái niềm hãnh diện cho cái người Việt ở đây. Just being on Argyle, it transports you to another world. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And I think to have, you know, a restaurant like Nha Hang Vietnam, which kind of is the namesake of Vietnamese restaurant. It's an invitation, not only into their kitchen and into their house, but it's an invitation to Argyle Street and this culture. So how did this Asian enclave end up on Argyle Street? Chicago actually had two Chinatowns. On the south side, you had the An Leong, but there also was one that originally was called the Hip Sing. And the Hip Sing Chinatown kept getting crowded out by new development. So Jimmy Wong, who was a popular restaurateur in downtown Chicago that was part of the Hip Sing, saw this sleepy little street on Argyle and starts to buy up property with the idea of making a whole Chinese immigrant themed uh, neighborhood. But then at the winding down of the war in Vietnam, there were plenty of people who were suddenly displaced. And where do they head to? This intended Chinese village on Argyle Street. So it's like a Vietnamese village fused on the groundwork of what was a Chinese village. The pricing of the apartments here in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, were all affordable, so that really attracted the immigrant community that, hey, we could have a place where we could afford, and the red line is right here, and so it's a conduit to the good jobs. My parents came from the Vietnam War as refugees. My dad was living here on Argyle Street. Our generation of people that grew up on Argyle call Argyle home. Ellen Young, who is, you know, the daughter of Q Ideas Legacy Business, Jennifer Pham, who is the daughter of Mini TX Pharmacy and also my business partner at Happy Yo. Jennifer Pham. Her and I, you know, we grew up knowing each other our whole lives. Her her mom and my father were classmates in Dalat in Vietnam, and they reconnected here. Uptown at that time was rough. But also there's just like all these beautiful moments of kids from around the world that come together and like learn. It was the most socio-economically diverse 
an ethnically diverse zip code in the whole state of Illinois. And so it was a cool thing because you'd see uh, kids from the Philippines and from Vietnam and kids from Ethiopia and Eritrea. And that's really that true authentic diversity that other neighborhoods only dream about having. I think that there was beginning footprints and imprints of a community coming together. Chinese Beach Relayed was founded by ethnic Chinese refugees who thought, hey, why don't we create an organization that will help others like acclimate to the US, right? And acclimate to Chicago, learning English, how do they get jobs, uh, how do they find housing. And I think like that kind of sense of like camaraderie and community really helped the transition for my parents as refugees here. My parents opened up Saigon Pharmacy and that was the first Vietnamese business on the street. And a lot of Southeast Asian businesses were just kind of emerging at the time. So that was kind of the onset of what is Asia in Argyle. I remember Argyle just being full of smells. You'd walk down the street and then you can just smell pho brewing. You can smell fruit, soup, noodles. It very much felt like home for me. It was a place where everyone looks like me. It wasn't strange to speak a different language, to eat funky stuff. I felt really seen, protected, and safe. So many Asian families who lived in Iowa, Wisconsin, they would literally come to Uptown for the groceries, for the, the restaurants, and, uh, and for that feeling of family. I think like being there in that moment as a child allowed me to solidify my cultural identity as being Vietnamese American. While the Vietnamese community has built a safe haven here, Asia on Argyle is just one strip in Uptown. So how did this neighborhood, eight miles north of downtown, even become a destination in the first place? All right, let's start it out and think of Uptown, let's say the late 19th century. The area was kind of the land of the dead. You were right near major cemeteries, and it was kind of like you were kind of in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the city. But here in the middle of this sparsely settled area was this place called Pop Morris's. Here's the place with the lights ablaze and music coming out of it. And once the elevated trains end there, it's natural that you're going to have all kinds of attractions. And suddenly Pop Morris's place, it gets torn down and gets transformed into a legendary green mill. Restaurants, nightclubs, dance halls, all proliferate in the same neighborhood. You were in a place that nobody knows you're there. You're all outsiders. And so that kind of built this kind of a reputation. Then you go from the Roaring Twenties to the grim days of the financial depression of the 1930s. The buildings kind of stayed the same, but the way they were used and their occupants were very different in a way. Stores and apartments that became converted into SROs. So that was a big change for people who lived there, who you would see on the street and who the businesses catered to. Uptown's welcoming reputation and affordability attracted newcomers, leading to the opening of bars like Carol's, a popular spot for Appalachian migrants, and Man's Country, a now shuttered gay bathhouse pivotal in shaping Uptown's burgeoning queer community. I moved to Chicago in the early 80s, and there wasn't a lot in Uptown when I first came here, but Man's Country was here. It had formerly been a Swedish lodge that Chuck Renslow had bought in 1973. Chuck Renslow was a legendary leather man who opened the Gold Coast. He opened uh, the Drag Bar Sparrows Center Stage, which was an enormous disco. But he always wanted to own the place where people went after they left the bar. And at the time, bathhouses were sort of like the next logical step. They were the place to take the party. It was a, like a getaway, the gay oasis. Then the area that was the music hall, as well as the floor directly beneath, became this techno queer club called Bistro 2. The village people performed there, Divine performed there, Boy George performed there. It was a big deal. It became much more of a focus of different nightlife in the area, especially men's nightlife. 
This strip in Northwest Uptown, which is now a part of Andersonville, saw more bars pop up over the years, such as Tees, Different Strokes, and The Eagle, defining Uptown as a gayborhood for years to come. It became part of the neighborhood rather than being apart from the neighborhood. When HIV and AIDS hit, there was a makeshift clinic that actually opened on the second floor of Man's Country at sort of the dawn of gay men's health, where at that time there weren't doctors necessarily a lot of sexually active gay men could go to with much confidence. So through the AIDS era, it became more of a place for condom distribution, for information distribution, and the bathhouses were closing in New York and San Francisco and LA. So the fact that man's country stayed open, you find an appreciation for the history and everything else that went on for, you know, the 45 years that it was there from 1973 to 2018. And as I saw it being torn down, the thing I saw more than anything was that it was the end of an era. You know, it was such a formative part of this community. While Man's Country has been torn down, many areas of Uptown are still home to a vibrant queer bar scene. Try to name another neighborhood anywhere in the world where you can catch drag shows inspired by country music and Southeast Asian culture within blocks of each other. But this distinct layering of cultures that defines Uptown may be in jeopardy as the neighborhood faces the natural forces of gentrification. Walking down the street over the last 30 years, I've seen how significantly changed it has become. It feels so different to us. We're seeing a lot of unfortunate uh, closures, storefronts are gone, businesses are gone due to the rise in rent. Developers are offering double, triple the appraised value on real estate, and uh, a lot of immigrant families are getting priced out, unfortunately. There's a lot of legacy businesses that have shuttered 20, 30 years, some 40 years on Argyle. There's kind of a sadness because those businesses are the heart of what makes Argyle Street, Argyle Street. So is that cultural identity still gonna remain on Argyle? My fear is that I don't want Argyle to become like Greek town. Right, where Greek town in Chicago used to have a vibrant Greek community and now it's just restaurants, but like no one really lives there. And will that be what happens with Argyle? Like that we're just gonna have like some restaurants and they're gonna lose slowly but surely more of their authenticity and you'll see more of them being replaced by Starbucks. And then it just becomes like, oh yeah, this was uh, a cool neighborhood back in the day, but now it's just another neighborhood. I've noticed that some people started to call it Andersonville East and this is, Uptown. Andersonville exists and it's an amazing neighborhood, but Uptown is Uptown. We have our own identity here and knowing that there's a possibility that it may no longer be there just really crushed my heart. I'm hoping with these new potential opportunities coming to Argyle that we can create more space where we feel seen and included. We all come from refugees, and I believe that it's really important to understand where we come from to move forward in a conscious and positive way. We all have this like connection that when we had our adventure in America, it all started in Uptown. We want to retain the culture and the diversity that Uptown has had for the last 50 years, and we want it to go for another 50 to 100 years. Uptown is in many ways potentially faced with a choice, right? How do we continue to support small mom and pop businesses of color to retain that cultural identity and that fabric of diversity within this neighborhood? How do we build an economic ecosystem of young entrepreneurs that will eventually, potentially, fill the vacancies? Welcoming progress, but also not trying to cover what uh, is our history. Argyle, to me, as cliche as it sounds, is home. It's a mix of languages, a mix of sounds. Um, you're seeing all types of people. And we're all walking together, exploring our culture, sharing things, and just looking out for one another. For the last like 40, 50 years, we have been the Ellis Island of Chicago. It's been like the starting point for so many immigrant families. It just like made this great 
base for like this ethnic diversity uh, that still is there and present. Walking down the street as a youth, I could smell the aromatic smells of, uh, you know, a 24-hour pot brewing. I think that kind of sense of memory still exists today. And so if you love those really authentic mom and pop restaurants where their heart is an ingredient in what you're eating, go visit Argyle. It's the hidden jewel. Having diversity in culture, food, music, life is a big gift of the city. That is what creates these amazing spaces in Chicago uh, where you have totally different walks of life, thoughts of life, connecting and getting to share with each other their belief system. Even with our neighborhood growing with new neighbors, I do feel the intentionality and care of people wanting to connect. There is that grit and that wonderful, colorful past and future that's happening. That's the beauty of Uptown. While there are many cultures represented in Uptown's restaurants, Demera, an Ethiopian staple, serves as a metaphor for the neighborhood itself. Just as Uptown's appeal is rooted in the blend of various cultures, Damara's platter invites you to mix and match an array of dishes. Let's dig in. Prepare to get yourself a little messy, at least that's how it rolls when I eat here. <laughs> you know, if it's done right, your hands are gonna be smelling like their spices for a couple of days. Once I had that first taste, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I love Ethiopian food. I have to come back. It was the food that hooked me, obviously. You can look out and see all this stuff happening. It's cozy, um, delicious, just a perfect recipe for a restaurant. <laughs> I grew up back home in Ethiopia. I was number seven of 11 children, but there was 23 people in the same household. So our food is communal eating. It's meant to be shared. We ate from one plate. My dad would always break in jara the bread and give you as a blessing, and that's how you're starting dinner. What I love about our dining is you are sharing. Share your food, share your thoughts, and connecting. We all eat together. Never eat Ethiopian food alone. Using your hands to eat, you're touching it, you're feeling it. So there is just more connection with the food. You were able to really get the texture of the food, the smell of the food. It just makes the experience so much more down to earth. It offers you some freedom to just go for it and try any new combination in any way you'd like. Our food is a lot of seasoning and spices, so when you eat it, it should feel warm, cozy, and that weekend. It takes a lot of time. For me, that's what I enjoy, like kind of build your spices or you build your ingredients time by time, and it gets deeper, like it has deeper flavors. Not, you're not tasting one thing, you're tasting multiple things. I'm a vegan vegetarian and sometimes it's hard when there's menu choices like to have to navigate that, but here I feel like I'm never limited with options that they have on the menu. In fact, it's very vegan vegetarian forward. Our cuisine has a long history of just cooking vegan. It's not something we're trying on, it's just something that is part of the culture. There is good flavor, good balanced food to have a vegan meal, and those are where the more creative dishes come. The yellow lentils, the potatoes, the sambusas, but the vegan masab is our go-to. We're definitely, I think, culturally, like, very social animal. Like, in Ethiopia, the first thing you do when you go to a new neighbor is you call them for coffee, and the coffee takes an hour and a half. You're roasting it in front of them, grinding it, making it a ceremonial. It's time to just enjoy. And our stuff is mostly from back home, so they have that in them. And it just became the culture of the restaurant. And what, is, what does hospitality mean to you? Hospitality is treating someone as if they're in your home. They're your guests. Serving them food, like serving them drinks. Like knowing what they need without them asking sometimes. They want to make you feel super comfortable, make sure you are well fed. If you know it's a good place if you keep wanting to come back, it's like home away from home here. 
Uptown has probably the most diverse food in the whole city. The crowd in Uptown is very diverse as well. It's from all over the world. I believe 60 something languages are spoken in Uptown. What makes Uptown so special is that you really feel all of the different cultures here. You feel at home regardless where you're from. I think everybody is like looking for those anchor spots in your neighborhood and like Demir is definitely one of those. Uptown's diversity of flavors, of people, of experiences is what makes this neighborhood a must visit. A day here is a chance to be a part of Chicago as it changes and to witness different migrant communities coming together to weave the unique cultural tapestry that Uptown is known for. Whether you're catching a show or your next great bite or just looking to let loose a little, there's something for everyone in Uptown.